ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final Yankee Air Museum Historic Presentation Night for the year 2023. I'm Jeff Bush, your host for the evening. We have 10 or 11 of these programs a year. If you are a non-member and hate to get in, and you come to all of these, are you aware that you're actually paying the equivalent to a companion membership at the Yankee Air Museum? And the only thing you're getting for paying if you come here is this. For the companion membership, you get a whole slew of benefits to be a member. Something to think about. Um, as we approach our winter season, our upcoming events decrease always. As always, please check the website, www.yankeeairmuseum.org, and watch for updates and information on newly listed upcoming events. And now if you'd like, uh, I'd like to ask you to turn your cell phones either off or stun. And, uh, Please hold all your questions for the end of the program. Our speaker tonight holds an undergraduate degree from Michigan Technolo Technological University in Houghton and a master's degree in history from Wayne State University. He retired in 2016 after 39 years with the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library in Ann Arbor. For the last 20 years, he held the position of senior photo archivist and was responsible for cataloging, arranging, and preserving the pres President Ford's White House negatives as well as the Ford family's personal pre- and post-presidential photographs. Tonight he's going to give you a biographical presentation on his family's experience during World War II. His father went off to war and eventually deployed to the China, Burma, India, or CBI Theater. Join me now in welcoming Mr. Kenneth Hayford. Can you hear me with this thing? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, many years ago, or early 2000s, I called my parents and said, what are you guys doing? And they told me they were shredding all their World War II letters. <laughs> and, and, you know, being an archivist for 39 years, I go, well, I can read Gerald Ford's mail, but I can't read your mail. And, and we did manage, they did manage to say, my dad had a few letters that he thought were important enough to save. And my mom wrote a lot of letters to her sister in Toledo, and the sister kept all of those. So we have what's going on with my dad overseas and what's going on in Detroit at the same time. And my dad was born on the east side of Detroit. It was in Kramick Township at that time, March 18, 1915. Uh, Hamp that part of it was the last part of uh, to be an accident in the city of Detroit was Ham Tramac Township. This is that he was born in a farmhouse on Van Dyke between seven and eight mile road, right near outer drive. My mom was born seven years later, almost to the day, and she also grew up on the east side of Detroit. My, my grandfather's farmhouse was on, on Van Dyke Avenue, and at that time, Van Dyke was just a dirt road in the 19-teens uh, and 20s, but uh, eventually it became M53, and it's a six lanes, seven lanes wide now. But uh, this farmhouse was where my dad was born. And in the early, third, early 20s, my dad, or my grandfather, started to subdivide his the 20 acre farm he built this gas station uh, you see the farmhouse is still back there and uh, by this time Van Dyke had been widened enough times that that little hill the house was on was now gone and uh, that's my grandfather standing in front of it and he put my dad in charge of, of the Hayfley service station and that's my dad working there. So he worked there in the late late 30s. And amongst the other things that my grandfather sold was property to the Archdiocese, these Archdiocese of Detroit. And this was, he sold five acres to them and it was a church where we all grew up and uh, was, was built there. This is roughly the property my, grand, my, my grandfather owned. The house was down on the bottom there. The gas station was right there, but that's now a restaurant and the whole church property is over on the side. But there's about a 
over 100 houses were built on that, that uh, in the Hayfleet Brothers subdivision. Well, they, both my mom and dad both went to Catholic high schools. My dad went to DLSL on the east side over by City Airport. My mom went to all girls Catholic school, uh, Nativity, which was on Harper. And at the Our Lady Queen Heaven Church where we grew up, uh, they have what they call the Dramatic Club. And my dad was part of that. And along with his brother John, his sister Rita, another sister Elizabeth, and his, his my future aunt, Mary, uh, my auntie aunt who married my uncle John. And my mom was also part of this group, although she's not in this picture. And these people pretty much stayed together uh, well into into the into the 2000s, uh, they were still they get together once a month to play pinochle. They weren't acting anymore. But uh, in 1940, my um, my dad and mom started dating. This almost didn't happen because my dad was seven years older than my mother, and uh, he thought that the a gap between a a 25 year old and an 18 year old was a little bit too much until his mother reminded him that his dad was six years older than she was. So that, that uh, thank, thank you, Grandma, for, for straightening my dad out. So, so during the 1940s, uh, 1940, they dated. But uh, things were happening in Europe. And so uh, my dad had to register, which he did on October 16th, 1940, for the draft. And on September 27th, 1941, they were married, again, at Our Lady Queen Heaven Church. Diary of Maxine Hazel, December 7th, 1941. Ed and I went for a ride as far as the Pier, Michigan. On our way back, we returned on the radio and we heard that Japan declared war on the USA, starting with the Philippines. War reports all day long. It gives you an indication how no one really knew where Pearl Harbor was or what was going on exactly. I mean, there was an article in Sunday's Free Press, I don't know if you saw it. It was an article, that was, uh, excerpts from the newspaper from December 8th. And they had like three battleships were sunk and, and most of the fleet got out of Pearl Harbor. It was, it was just, it was, there was the utter confusion of those, those, those days. Diary of Maxine Hagley, December 8, 1941. Already 32 nations are in the war. Ed and I went to 5.30 Mass at Holy Name. Came home and had breakfast and listened to the radio for war news. Ed went to work and I had quite a busy day at the office. Roosevelt made a definite declaration of war on Japan. So, uh, my dad and already being 28 years old, when the, when, or almost 28, but when the war started, he wasn't he wasn't immediately called up, so he continued working in the gas station. Uh, and, but he did have uh, organize a scrap rubber drive uh, at, at his station, and a number of other gas stations did did this as well. So they got a, a write up in one of the three Detroit newspapers. But the rest of the rest of 1942 is basically, you know, general regular activities. Although my mom was pregnant at the time, and well, it's all over, and you have a bouncy little nephew to buy Christmas presents for now. Letter from Edward to his sister Irene, September 18th, 1942. Yeah, that's uh, my aunt Irene was out in, in California. My my uncle Laverne was was involved in, in the aerospace, so he was probably working on one of the aircraft plants out there. But uh, by the by the end of 1942, most of the men in the neighborhood were in the service. Uh, my dad and his brother, older brother John, weren't. John was a chemical engineer, and my grandfather was also on the draft board, and, and he decided that John was more, uh, his chemical engineering experience was more important in, fact, in, in the States than it was in the, uh, overseas. So John got a deferment, but my dad was drafted. Although, just recently having the baby, they tried to appeal that. 
January 6, 1943, Ed's draft case is now being taken up by the State Board Lansing Popular Army. We think the petition is brought it on, but we don't know. Ed wants to enlist in the Navy or the Marines so people wouldn't talk. Crazy, isn't he? That, that's a perfect example of my mother. I mean, it's just, she, 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 uh, you know, there wasn't an argument she, she didn't want to win. And uh, so, but these petitions uh, apparently just went through the neighborhood, because the other neighbors had their, their husbands, sons, and, 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 uh, and uh, brothers were already in the service. January 12th, 1943. Ed hasn't heard anything yet, and of course, he didn't do any enlisting. I'd never consent. As if she could. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just... February 3rd, 1943. Ed was to the Board of Appeal Monday night, and they said he will have to go. He'll probably be gone by the end of this month or first part of April. They told him if he didn't appeal it, he would have been inducted Friday, and he would leave on the 12th. So appealing it helped a little bit anyways. I guess that will work this week and that's all. So on March uh, 2nd, he was declared 1A and, and getting ready to go into the service. Uh, 
the best man in the Iraqis. But I went through the records and found out that I had, and I took the Army General Classification to the ABCT, I got 119 on it, which is quite high. And uh, so I'm going through the records, uh, they picked me out as the one to go to uh, this classification school in Brooklyn, South Dakota. That was in May, I think, of 43. So I'll go back to Brookings, your typical little Midwest town. And on the, on the university campus uh, was where they did their training. I find this picture interesting because while the Army was, was still segregated by unit, uh, the classes apparently worked because there, there's a, the, the gentleman in the upper right uh, corner. And, and uh, the same group uh, in another picture in Brookings. So in August of 1943, he passed his uh, the classification class. And before he left, he stopped at Hoff's Millinery and bought my mom a dress. Probably the only time he ever bought my mom a dress. I, 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 I don't know my brothers and sisters are here. They can make, they can make no more than I do, but I don't think he's ever did it before or after. So it was back to Romulus, where he was at. He was, uh, again, able to go home. And here he is uh, uh, at the air base. Then, uh, 19, March 21st, 1944, he got orders to go to Homestead Army Airfield near Miami. You are leaving this office only because I was directed to send the best qualified man. I am very sorry to have you leave and would be glad to have you serve with me at any time. I am sure you will do an excellent job in setting up a classification office at your new base. Sincerely yours, Herbert Lloyd, First Lieutenant. Now the first part of the letter says he would have been a, uh, uh, got a promotion to sergeant before he left, but uh, there's limitations in their table of organization, so he, he didn't get his sergeant stripes yet. But he was replaced by another sergeant. Gene Autry uh, showed up at Romulus. He was a flight officer. And he came in the day I left. We're on the same special orders. Same special order, the, the special order that shipped us out and, and the special order that brought him in. His name is Ormond, O-R-M-O-N-D, Ormond G. Autry. Uh, I took him to the PX and had coffee with him. And we walked in there, everybody started humming, tumbling me. <laughs> that's as far as it got. We never got Christmas cards or presents from, from Uncle G. Unfortunately, it would have been fun. But uh, so my dad had, had enough time to go home and, and say goodbye to my mom and my brother Danny before he headed off to Homestead. And actually, even though he's in the Air Force or the Army Air Corps, he took a train to Homestead. <laughs> and they've been living in a rented house in south of uh, Six Mile near Van Dyke. And, and once my dad was shipped out, uh, uh, they moved in. My mom and Denny moved in with, uh, with her parents and couples and her two sisters who weren't married. <laughs> so, down to Homestead. March 28, 1944, Homestead, Army Airfield. Now I know why rich boys like to come to Florida. This is one swell place for a civilian, but it's just another workshop for a GI. Our stay here is indefinite, and where we're going is still very much a secret. Love, Ed. And a month later, it was still a secret, but he got orders to board a C-46 for uh, it turns out for India, and on this other plane, at the bottom of the, of the people on the other plane was a fellow by the name of Harold Moore. This was another one of my dad's lifetime friends, although they didn't know each other then. They didn't. They met later on on this trip. So this was the actual plane my dad flew in. It's a C-46. Uh, Things interesting about it is that a range of 1,200 miles. 
But we'll see as if this goes along, uh, it can fly a little bit farther than that. So it started off going from Homestead to San Juan, Puerto Rico, down to Georgetown, British Guyana, to Bellum, Brazil, and finally to Natal, Brazil, before they had to start flying across the Atlantic Ocean. We went to each two stops in Brazil and then to Natal, which is right on the hump of uh, Brazil, closest to Africa. And in between there in Africa is uh, Ascension Island, just a little dot out there in the Atlantic Ocean. If you overflew it, there's no place else to go. So we watched the navigator, we all had a navigator back then, the crew was a co-pilot, Pilot, co pilot, navigator, crew chief, and uh, radio operator. Those were the uh, crew. He'd watch that navigator, he'd be looking down at the ocean through something, I forgot what they call it, and then he'd look at the sky and he'd scratch his head. You wonder, does this guy know what he's doing or doesn't he? Then, he, then they had a prearranged uh, signal that if we had to ditch, which means you had to land in the ocean, they would sound this certain horn. Well, we got close to the island, already in sight, when this prankster, he sounds that horn, and everybody's going to the ditch in the ocean, but, but we landed on Ascension, or Ascension, just a small island. In fact, there's a, there's a little hump there you couldn't see from one, the run runway you couldn't see from one end to the other because there was a hill in the middle of it, so you go up and down, down the other side. Like I said, the plane had a range of 1,200 miles. Yeah. So, it gets even scarier as it is as we go along here. So once they got to Accra, it was across uh, the center of Africa, through the Gold Coast to Aden and Saudi Arabia via Madagari, French Equatorial Africa, El Fashir, and and Khartoum. All these all these countries are not. I mean, all these places no longer exist. I mean, uh, they, they, they are in their own new countries. But again, you'd be surprised the stuff that they had overseas. You know, after we took, you know, on our plane on the way over to India, we had a jeep on board with the ramp to drive it up on it. And then a couple of the guys sneaked a Cushman uh, three-wheel scooter on the store and took it on and put it on the plane. We were the only ones over there with a three-wheel scooter until it finally broke down. <laughs> Pitch it any way you could, make it run, run a little longer, but uh, eventually it gave up. Okay, so you had 19 servicemen, a Jeep, and a Cushman scooter on this plane. And it, it, that only got 1,200, uh, 1200 miles to the, to the, to the tank full. But uh, they still, I don't know how they managed to do it, but they, they got it across. Then once they got to Aden, they flew to Marsira Island off of Oman, then up to Karachi, uh, India at that time, now it's Pakistan. Then across uh, India to Kalakunda Air Base, which is about an hour or two west of Calcutta. These are new maps, so that's why the, the spelling is going to be different. But that's roughly the, the flight he took. There was a uh, article on June 5th, 1944, Life magazine about roughly this trip, but it was done by a four-engine C-87, and it took them uh, 10 days for a round trip. I'm, and I don't know how long this actual trip took. I'm sure it was probably 10 days just on its own. <coughs> But the part of India he was in on the east side was, was uh, a lot of rice paddies. At first I thought maybe this picture was taken somewhere in Africa, but they did have camels in this part of India. So, so once you got to, got to Kalakunda, uh, the, the town near the Kalakunda was Karajpur, he got uh, his guide to India. Email, May 11, 1944. Somewhere in India. I'm really roughing it now. It takes a little while to get adjusted to this kind of life, but I'm faring all right so far. We are living in tents, sleeping on base army cots. In general, the real army life. I saw a lot of different countries on the way over, 
and I'll take one little piece of the U.S. in preference to all of them put together. Now, all through the war, it was always somewhere in India or India. It was never, it was never disclosed where he was. He didn't disclose that until, until he was on his way home, practically. June 26, 1944, India. We're here, it's still hot, but the rainy season is starting. We will have cooler weather for the next couple of months or more. Yesterday, we had a heavy downpour that left the entire area a mass of mud and water. This is a new base, and the drainage leaves much to be desired. We have moved from the tents into our permanent barracks. That precludes the possibility of the tents folding up on us in the rainy season. However, the tents did not leak, and the straw roofs of the barracks do a little. I guess we can't have everything, though. Now, most of the work was done by, by local uh, hires. Now, he took all these pictures. He borrowed a camera from, from his uh, sister. Actually, Jim was your mom. Uh, uh, and June 26, 1944, India. We're getting a case of beer a month. That doesn't seem like much, but I can make it last. We're also getting enough candy and cookies to keep the majority of the fellows satisfied. They come in handy when the meals get skimpy, which happens quite often. After I got to be sergeant, I, uh, I was CQ, which, uh, which means charge of quarters. You're in the order room overnight. The order room's open 24 hours. So it's your duty then in the morning, crews are going out. You gotta wake up the crews, walk around, and shake them up, get them out of bed. And then uh, they report to the orderly room, and then shuttle will take them out to the, to the uh, operations uh, tower. And, uh, this one guy, he came, he came in after the shuttle had left, and uh, so I'm gonna get out there now. I said, uh, we'll take the shuttle. And he gave me a nice, nice obscene word about the shuttle. I said, you do that, I'm tired. Boy, he put me in a race. I'm not sure he's not seeing when I get back. I'm not sure I was gonna get an assassin an officer. But uh, nothing came of it. And this oral history was taken outside of the campfire. So once in a while you get a little breezy uh, wind sound going through the, through the speaker. July 6th, 1944, India. Dear son, Benny, I spent the whole day in town today, but I couldn't find anything for you or mom. I did pick up the stationery though. I hope you like it. I also picked up a pocket-sized photo album in which to keep the pictures which mama sends me. You tell her to send plenty of them. When this album is filled, I'll get another. Mama writes that you have been a good boy. I'm sure you are. Also, I hear you are acquiring quite a vocabulary. I wish I could hear you talk. Tell Mama to pray that it won't be too long. Goodbye for now, Daddy. And give Mama a big kiss for me. Daddy. This time, Daddy, is not quite two years old. So, in August, he got his Good Conduct Medal. So, he was APO 493, so that's that's... Everything my mom sent to him went to APO 493. They had a couple of US, USO shows, United Service Organization shows that came over there, but uh, not too many, not too bad. Uh, they eventually put up a screen where we could watch movies. So they had movies just about every other night. And uh, for, for seats, they had these steel runway maps that they laid for temporary runways. Now they had a lot of them over there that they didn't need, so they set them up on cement blocks and that was our benches for watching movies. Now, uh, uh, some of you probably know this, uh, the technical name for those was Marston Matting, but they had plenty of it over there. And uh, Lily Pond was there, Lily Pond and Andre Castellanos, I don't know if you ever heard of them. She was a singer and he was a, uh, yeah. They were there, but those are about the only ones, uh, as far as the USO, uh, that we ever saw. We're getting movies every other night now. The pictures aren't too old. 
Over here, the age of the picture doesn't mean much anyhow. They're all good. In August 1944, he took to he got just a day trip to, to Calcutta. So he took a number of photographs there. I'm ready from the list of men's club. Uh-oh. I have back that up. I'm writing from the Liston Men's Club. It's a very well furnished club, very similar to the ones in the States. It was impossible to get a room or a bunk here at the club. I'm staying in a small hotel at six rupees a night. I've been coming to the club every morning to shower. They have a barber here also, and that takes care of the shaving problem. I've done practically all of my traveling by rickshaw. It is fairly fast and a lot cheaper than taxis. There is more traffic than I expected, although a great majority of it is military vehicles. Street cars are very modern. I don't use them because I'm not familiar with their routes. Then, first wedding anniversary of separated. Uh, surprisingly, my mom only sent him one card. As we get farther into the program, you'll see she's quite a prolific card sender. This is the first letter I've written in almost a week. I had a three-day pass, which was extended to four, when the plane came in a day late. This time I went to Agra, the home of the Taj Mahal. To say that I had a swell time would be putting it mildly. Then to top it off, there were about 25 letters waiting for me when I got back, including real letters of the 9th, 11th, 12th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and Denny's pictures. They are really nice. Hey, time to go to the best and cheapest Taj Marble store. Uh, I find this this thing is hilarious. Uh, they, he went and bought uh, he was in embroidery purses, curio curiouses, photo views, guidebooks, albums, sword sticks. He bought a sword stick, by the way. He brought that home. But as kids, we used to pull it out to show our friends, and finally one day he snapped it over his knee and tossed it in the trash. <laughs> so, but uh, but I, I read the endorsements on on the lower uh, uh, right side there. They're just uh, bought a few things from the place. The article is very cheap and good for the price. And, and I certify that I purchased a black marble box at this place very reasonably and recommend it to anyone. But then we had a signet signed by Sergeant. Gavant's Fugal. It doesn't really sound like it's someone from the American Army, but I'm not sure, but that, that's what he says. And uh, P.F. Steve Kapoor. So, but he did buy a couple of uh, his best marble uh, Taj Mahals there, though. At least, I don't know if it was this store, but, but he did buy some marble. Taj to get to town, we hired a Tonga, which is a two wheel horse pulled cart. They make pretty good time, but the horse is so close to the cart that when he does certain things, the smell isn't the best. We had one horse that must have had gas paints or something. <laughs> Anyhow, what he let loose would make a skunk turn up his nose and shame. <laughs> I saw my first snake charmer act. The kid had two keen cobras in a basket, which rose up and extended their hoods when he played his flute, or whatever it is. He also had two big pythons and an assortment of smaller snakes. I took some pictures of them, which I hope will come out okay. Needless to say, I didn't get too close. Also, we kicked in with eight honest apiece to watch a mongoose kill a snake. He put on quite a battle, but the snake wound up being behind the eight ball. Now, I'm not sure if PR ASPCA would have that kind of activity anymore, but this is interesting. We ate a complete meal in a Chinese restaurant in town, but they couldn't compare with the GI meals at the mess hall. They did have good orange juice, though, which we ordered and drank by the gallon. It was very hot during the day. And Thanksgiving, uh, you can see that, I'm not sure if it's a Hallmark card or not, but it's, it's, it's very military oriented. Then we came Christmas. Now, see, I mentioned my mom was a prolific card sender. So we have one, two, Three cards from my mom. 
all very elaborate. And then a number of cards from friends and relatives. These, these are all in a box I found with war memorabilia, so these are all authentic. And he was, so they got plenty of mail. Including some that were, uh, again, military oriented. Uh, then, then what you would get from the CBI was a little bit uh, less fancy. So this is back scene in Denny. Well, honey, it's Christmas Eve, my first away from home, and God permitting, my last. I'd give anything to be home with you and Denny, but as that's impossible, I'm with you in spirit. We're having a midnight mass tonight in the Tank Town Theater. Today's chapel couldn't possibly hold all the men who want to attend. They were standing at mass this morning, so you can imagine what it will be like with all the once-a-year men attending. Well, you did manage to find a, a, a fairly ornate uh, CBI Christmas card as well as the same home. I'm not even sure it's a Christmas card, it's just a reading from India. Meanwhile, back at home, my mom was working at, at the Briggs plant on uh, Outer Drive between Mound and Van, uh, Van Dyke. Uh, and it was, it was a short walk from the house uh, where her parents lived so she could walk to work every day. She made uh, you know, her ID card at uh, Briggs. I guess at this point we can show her social security number. <laughs> and she had made a number of friends at, at Briggs. Mrs. H wants me to go to Anchorville over the weekend, but as long as I'm right here, I don't feel so bad. But when I go over to their house, to the cottage, or someone else's house, when Ed's not with me, I really get lonesome then. Now, Anchorville is at the very top, on the top of Anchor Bay, it's a cottage of my, my grandparents. So you can see, it was it was it's about a 30 mile drive, you know, when you're rationing gas, they usually, it would carpool to get people to go up there. Uh, the house still exists up there. And she must have, in her letter she said she didn't want to go, but she must have been convinced to go because this picture is dated the same day that letter was dated. <laughs> so. July 11, 1945. Sunday, Sal, Danny, and I went to Anchorville. We sat around the boat quite a bit, but the sun wasn't strong enough to give me a burn or a tan. You see, Danny is wearing his nice little military cap there. Okay. So, she, it, besides that, she was sending lots of photographs to my dad. Most of them were nice, you know, I got a new dress today sort of things. Uh, but then, there were, she would send, these are the things my dad was missing. She sent the sexy pictures. <laughs> yeah, well, these are my, my grandfather, my grandmother, and, and my mom and her four, four sisters. My uncle, my uncle Joe, was in was drafted in, in, in uh, January of 1943. He was 18, and he was he did his uh, basic training at, at uh, Fort Custer, just like my dad did, and. Then he was shipped off to North Africa, but by the time he got to North Africa, the, the, the war, uh, the, the, that part of the war had ended, and uh, he was finally sent to, uh, with a, he was in a repo depot, and, and ended up going with uh, the 34th Division into Italy, but uh, after, after Sicily and after Salerno. So again, it's all the sisters. And the, the, the three sisters with their three kids, the, the three married sisters. And this is my other grandparents. Uh, they live, they still live in that farmhouse uh, uh, Van Dyke, and so my mom spent a lot of time with them too. And my other grandfather, Uncle, my Grandpa Joe Lucas, he was, I guess that'd be Civil Air Patrol or, or something, but uh, I'm not sure how often you got to wear that when you're on the east side of Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a nice picture, though. At least, at least I assume that's my grandfather. Yeah. 
Now, my mom was in charge of the ration stamp. I mentioned earlier you have to, you know, gas is rationed if you want to drive it 30 miles up to, to, to Anchorville Cottage. And so she was in charge of that. She was also in charge of, of getting the tires inspected. Now, since she had the A book, she had to get her tires inspected every six months. But as you can see, they were factory seconds already when, when they got them. And, uh, but uh, this, this, she had to do this several times. And my brother Danny had his own, his own set of uh, ration cards as well. And then he also had to buy bonds. March 28, 1945. Friday evening, Mom and I went on ration. I bought Danny a pair of white shoes for Sunday only. I got an extra coupon from the ration board for his, and I asked for one for myself. But I got a notice that my application was rejected. I wanted to get a pair of saddle oxfords for myself. I managed to get two pair of 51 gauge stockings. <laughs> Monday, Mrs. Hafley got a letter from Ed written on the 15th of March. He says, I suppose by now Maxine has given you all the details about my leg. He said he wrote me a letter on the 14th telling me all about it. He said all his clothes are gone, but he managed to save a few personal belongings. He said they took x-rays of his leg, but he thinks he'll be up and about in a few days. Well, as it turned out, he did, she didn't get his letter. It, uh, the only thing she knew was what my, uh, her mother-in-law, my grandmother, was telling her from the letter that, that she had received. But this is what the letter was about. In March of 45, we had a typhoon that went through there and uh, knocked over all our barracks, practically all of them. Because they were just hollow shells, bamboo roof, straw. There were cement walls, but uh, the roof was straw with them, and it was uh, burlap and then straw on top of that. Men. 
No B-29s were hurt, though, so uh, it's okay if we lost a few guys. But uh, besides these, uh, Eight men who were killed. One, one plane in the uh, that flew out of Calicunda was lost. So uh, the whole base only 13 men were ever lost. Mm -hmm. This is the other uh, seven guys who were uh, killed in that that storm. I tried looking up some of these on Ancestry, but there's a lot of common names like Wolf and, and, uh, and uh, you know, they're 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 kind of hard to look for, and it wasn't, uh, maybe when I have more time, I'll look again. So a week later, my dad turned 30, and a week after that was Easter, or next two days, a week after that was Easter, and again, and my mom sent me cards, and there's another one. And Easter Sunday, this is marked as Easter Sunday, but uh, I look at, I. Uh, other pictures I've seen of the theater doesn't have those little trees on it, so I'm not sure if it's if it's Easter or Christmas. So, uh, but, uh, I, who might have disputed my dad? I'll tell you right off the back. Eighth of May, 1945, India. Dearest Maxine and Danny, I can just imagine the celebrations and excitement which must be gripping Detroit and the nation tonight. It's VE Day, and every time I think of it, the goose pimples rise on my arm and chills run up and down my spine. I'd like to be back celebrating with you, but it's just as well that I'm over here. Even though I didn't have much to do with the actual fighting, I'm glad and proud to be a member of Uncle Sam's army. One thing that everyone in the States must have missed today was President Roosevelt's flowery voice. What a day this would have been for him. That he should miss it by less than a month is really tragic. I think I'll be plenty busy for a while now, getting the points totaled up. I don't have enough, so don't start getting out of my civvies yet. I'll be in for the duration plus, but I don't care. I was a long time getting in, so let the fellows with the longest service get out first. Now, I'm not sure anybody else would describe Franklin Roosevelt's voice as flowery, but uh, that's, that's uh, good. Uh, my mom was not as big a fan of Franklin Roosevelt as, as he was, because. Uh, she was, up, she was upset that her brother was shipped off without even being able to say goodbye or anything. She was just, she was, tough. She was not a real Roosevelt. July 29, 1945, Sunday. Dear M, Len, and Roger, I just put Danny to bed for his nap. When he wakes up, we're going to meet Emma Rockwell and her son, Denny. She's the gal who was in the hospital with me, and we're going to the zoo. I'm to meet her at 2.30. So life was fairly normal still for my mom and Aunt Danny. Uh, by this time, she had left Briggs. I think they were you know, the was, the war was winding down. I think you know, they gave people the option of, of, of quitting work. And at the end of July of '45, uh, she stopped working. So then she was collecting unemployment. My picture was in the paper yesterday. It shows the long line waiting for compensation. You can hardly tell it's me. Did we laugh? I went there Tuesday and stood in line from 3 to 5.30. Boy, what I won't do for $22 a week. <laughs> My name in August of 44, about 45. They split our group, sent some of them over to Okinawa by air, and the rest of us stayed behind in India and eventually took a train into Calcutta and board the ship, the troop transport, and we went all the way over now on transport. Took six weeks, 42 days to get there. Then we stopped and us. Fast finger, I'm sorry. Okay. Took six weeks, 42 days to get there. Then we stopped in Australia. some things, but he didn't have to do a lot. But his friend Harold Moore was a cook in the kitchen, 
and would bring my dad pies and things, so uh, it worked out well for both of them. Harold was an interesting character. He always wanted to get a tattoo, and they went out to get one. He and my dad, I believe it was in, uh, in Agra, and they looked all day for, for a tattoo parlor, and they finally found one. They went in, and, and the, uh, the uh, proprietor told them the building was off limits, so they had to hurry up and get out of there before the MPs caught them. So I don't know, my dad never did get a tattoo, and I'm not sure if Harold ever got his or not. <laughs>
October 9, 1945. Monday morning, Mrs. Hazley called me up. I told her how I've been looking for rent. She said, you know, we still have another house that we are renting, and Pa suggested that it would be nice for Ed to have. It's a little house right across from the church, right next door to the nuns. Kaczynski's used to live in it. I thought the people living there had bought the place, but they never did. Danny and I went over to Hayfley's, and I asked her to serve notice on the people in the house on Roliet. I told her even if Ed wasn't coming home for a few months yet, I'd like to get out as soon as possible so that we could make room for Junior. Mr. Hayfley said he'd have the lawyer take care of it right away. Now, Junior was her brother, Joe. Uh, he was uh, staff sergeant. He was in charge of two of these 81 millimeter mortar crews. And I was, uh, uh, same uh, nephew that did the oral history with my dad did one with him. And he was saying that the German 80 millimeter uh, shells fit in the, in the 81 millimeter American mortar. So they were lobbing German shells onto the Germans. He, he, he witnessed the, the bombing of uh, Monte Cassino. Uh, while he was there. October 30th, 1945. Denny and I came here for a while on Wednesday night. This is the only agreement Laverne would think of. No room and board charges, and as far as food goes, who goes to the store, pays the bill, and he thinks it will work out just about even. He said to me on a regular 50-50 basis, he thinks leads to arguments. Pretty good, isn't it? Ed thought he might be leaving by the end of October or the first part of November. He's supposed to be come back by boat. Maybe he'll make it for Thanksgiving. And th this house is on the west side of Detroit. It's on Sorrento. This, this is actually a modern picture. We got points to uh, for discharge purposes. How many kids you had? How many went overseas? How many citations you got? How many this, that, and the other thing? They all added up the points, and uh, I had enough points to get go home. So on uh, in November of 45, and we left uh, Okinawa on a B-29, flew to Guam, to Kwajalein, to Hawaii, and eventually to Major Field, Sacramento. Oh yeah, at least, at least this plane had a greater range than the C-46 to B-29. He said that's the only time he ever saw a B-29 was the day he got on one. Off to Sacramento. Flew into Major Field in Sacramento and uh, right around Thanksgiving, so we had a big Thanksgiving dinner there. And, uh, and they, they wanted to keep me in because of my classification, classification specialist, but I had enough points to override that, so they sent me to uh, Chinook Field in Illinois by train. From there, I got my discharge and came home. To, took a train back to Chicago, Chicago, to, and got off at Jackson, met, met Maxine and Jackson, and we. Oh, there was his discharge. Dear Edward, well, old man, how is civilian life? Has the color of that tweed suit gotten you down? I hope you are finding that civilian life is all that you thought it would be. Now, to get down to the business at hand, my purpose in writing to you is to remind you of a few things we talked about on that last day you were in the Army. You remember Form 100, Draft Board, and all of that. In this envelope, you will find several forms which are very important to you. Take care of them, because you may need them. Say, by the way, I hope you haven't forgotten to report to your local Selective Service Board. You will remember you were to do that within 10 days after your discharge. I want to remind you that if you have any problems that are about insurance or veterans' rights under the GI Bill, you can obtain that information from your local Veterans Administration office. And if I can help you, write to Counseling Officer, Separation Base, Chanute Field, Illinois. Good luck, civilian, and I hope you get one of those swell jobs we all talked about down in the day room. So, right, December 3rd, he took, took care of it and got reclassified as 1C. But before he left, 
Every, everybody, I guess, is, and when you get discharged, even though the war was over, you still got one of these pamphlets that uh, tell you how to behave once you were there, not to disclose to any, anything, uh, not to speak bad of your allies. Uh, uh, the enemy may still be listening. And so this was actually came out in 44, so uh, uh, you had to be you had to be careful then. It's a little bit different by the time my dad got out, but uh, they they still issued these to everybody. Stick to personal experiences. Don't talk about where you were. Uh, don't identify your unit without getting permission. Don't mention specific places. Don't mention secret arms, equipment, procedures, flying techniques, strength of units, or fighting ca figures on casualties. And don't say things about your fellow soldiers that you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't supposed to tell them how you, if you escaped, you weren't supposed to let people know how you did that because the enemy could, uh, could pick up that information and stop the next guy. So that was, that was what he got uh, when he left the Army. He also got one of these letters from Harry Truman, I'm sure after writing about four million of those, uh, and his son was probably pretty tired. But, uh, <laughs> working in a presidential library for 39 years, I know how this works. <laughs> so this is a map my dad drew of his, his trip. He had uh, every continent but Antarctica in Europe, and he finally got to Europe in 1989. We went to visit the, the uh, ancestral hometown of Kling now Switzerland. They moved into this house on uh, Roliet, uh, my, nine months after my dad got home, my brother Alan was born, uh, my sister Donna was born in this house too, and then they kind of outgrew it, so they moved like four doors to the right, to the left, uh, to a slightly bigger house where I was born, and in 1953 they moved 15 houses to the left, to the right, <laughs> to another house that my uh, my grandfather had built, and my that my, my grandmother and grandfather were living in that house, and they they decided to move up to the Anchorville house on a permanent basis. So they brought back a number of souvenirs. My dad did a, a number of these marble Taj Mahals. <laughs> this little uh, cart down here. Uh, you can see it over there. It's still like an ivory cart. Um, actually, my brother, brother Alan, just uh, was in pieces. He just put it together last week and sent me a picture of it. And then the machete, which I actually have in a briefcase behind me here. I just don't want to get pulled over by the police on my way home. Uh, then we have the, the, the wine glasses or metal wine cups. I have one of those in my briefcase too. And these really cool. Cobra candelabras. <laughs> and he also had the the official CBI boots, which were Denny's, but uh, he quickly outgrew them, and they were still around when I was a kid, and I wore them out. And and lots of coins that he brought back. <coughs> so when he came back, he, he went back to work at the gas station, and uh, until until. Early 50s, he got a job at the tank plant uh, in Warren, up on uh, Love Mile in Van Dyke. And his time in service was added to it, so when he retired on December 29, 1980, he was given a time in service from, from uh, June, uh, 19, June 19, 1948. This is a shadow box, that's why the picture's not real good. It's kind of the uh, uh, glare on the, the plastic glass. So, that's the part I don't like. <laughs> so my dad passed away. <laughs> you can read it. <laughs> Three sons, two daughters, 11 grandchildren, 16 great grandchildren. Uh, so the voices, uh, my brother Danny, uh, was, oh, the, the, my dad, actual voice was an oral history, my, my, my nephew Darren, and my, my, my brother Danny was the voice of my, my dad, my, my sister Donna was the, my mom's voice, and uh, a friend of mine, Dave Oxman, was the other voices. 
Now, uh, this is Darren. Uh, Darren went into the service in 2001, and this picture was taken December of 2002, a couple of old sergeants there. And uh, so my, my dad, uh, we had diabetes for 58 years, so he never really gained any weight, so he didn't even fit in his uniform uh, at this time. And I want to thank my, my aunt for saving all those letters from my, my uh, mom to her. And that's just photo acknowledgments. My dad took 180 some photographs when he was in India and that's borrowed a few from Google and Wikipedia. So that's it. introductions here. Uh, my brother Denny's all grown up over there now. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister Donna back there. And, and other boys. Dave in the back over there. Raise your hand, Dave. Uh, uh, huh? Yeah, well, my sister Marcia is here. Too. She wasn't born until 1955. Though. So she, she missed out on all this stuff. But I do, you know, I mentioned the little silver set. And we have, we have the machete. But it's two little knives in the hilt. Very nice. So I borrowed this from my brother. That's why I, I make sure I kept it in the briefcase. Like I said, I don't want to get pulled over by the police. <laughs> First thing I say, I say, you know, there's a machete in the back seat. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Well, there was the, well, like I said, I found his dog tag today. And he had a number of patches, his Camp Perry patch, and his patch from the CVI patch. And he's got kind of tricked out CVI patch, and so glitter and, and other and stuff. So, I'm ready for questions. Anybody can tell me how a C-46 could uh, do all that, fly all that way with all that stuff on it. Uh, yeah, they flew C 46s out of Willow Run Airport until 1982. Okay. Transcontinental Airlines had them. I, I flew there for a short time. They put extra gas tanks in them. Okay, yeah. Were you get extra gas tanks when you already had 19 guys a Jeep and a, and a cushion? <laughs> sure. They, they didn't worry about weight and stuff back then. If it's good, you went. <laughs> okay. I have another comment, too. Yes. Uh, the letters here are, are such an important part of history. And I, I know when I was flying around Vietnam, letters from home were, were as precious as gold. But nowadays, nobody writes letters anymore. They Facebook, they text, they send emails. Have we lost a lot of history because of that? Yeah, uh, I, would, I would imagine so. Uh, you know, working in presidential libraries like I did, you know, we have, you know, at the Ford Library, we had documents, documents, documents. We had 29, 25 million pages of documents. Uh, the Obama Library and Trump Library are all going to be digitized. So there's, they may have the documents, but you're not going to have physical documents. They're all going to be online. You, can, you won't have to go to a physical brick and mortar library to look at them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but uh, well, I, I, I've got text messages on, on my phone that go back from from a family that go back to 2010, I think. So I do save my messages. But, but you know, this, this, my phone's pretty full. Danny, you had a question. It wasn't really a question. I wish I'd known you were going to highlight the boots. I still have those boots at home. Oh, you do? <laughs> I do, yes. Oh. I thought I destroyed it. I brought next time. In fact, I'll get them to you. You can take them and add them to your briefcase. So. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay, we, uh, um, I was wondering, oh, Rebecca. Uh, Sarah. Sarah. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think I missed what CBI stood for. China, Burma, India. Okay. It's the, the forgotten theater. Uh, most of what they were doing at the, the, the base in Kalakunda was flying uh, fuel into Burma. Uh, but once the, the B-29s didn't really need the fuel because they, 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 they had much larger part of the range so they could fuel up somewhere else to, to deliver their payloads. But that's, uh, so that's why they, in the last year, they, they didn't have a whole lot to do while they were, while they were in India. 
Yes, quick. Pat. Ken, do you have any uniforms that were your dad's? My nephew Darren has my, my dad's army uniform. So I think that's when, when, when he put that one on, that's uh, he got it from Darren. Yeah. Hi. You and the mask. Me and the mask. <laughs> yeah, I've grown up and I've, of course have heard about all the rationing and gas stamps and things like that, but you mentioned your tire inspections, something I've never heard of. What were they inspecting the tires for? We wanted to make sure, well, they didn't want you getting new tires. It was mostly to make sure this tire is good and you're going to have to keep it for another six months because we need all the rubber we can to send overseas for, for uh, you know, make, make uh, tires for, for military vehicles and the like. So. Yes, Jody. What's that? Remember well, well, she, well, that was that was her honeymoon. Uh, I found a postcard from my mom on her honeymoon. She wrote, she wrote a, a postcard to her sister in shorthand. <laughs> so, so, but then she wrote, "I hope you can read this in English uh, in regular writing too." But that that was uh, well, well, they were on the honeymoon. Yes. So, what was your father's role? What did he do? He was uh, in the operations tent. I mean, he said he. Uh, he got the, the planes, the crews ready in the morning. He would he would work, work the night shift. Got the crews ready in the morning so they could fly, like uh, what they say, over the hump to 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 Burma. So uh, that's that's pretty much me working in the, the the classification office. That he did. That's pretty much what he did all the time. Uh, unfortunately, when my my nephew did that interview, he didn't ask. Those questions. Like, you know, what did you? What did you? What, what did you send over? What, what, what shipments did you have? That kind of stuff. I mean, it was, it was a high school project. So. That's cool. But uh, yeah. What What is a classification officer? <laughs> he he assigned he assigned the people to, to uh, like pilots the planes. They didn't always have the same planes. You know. I, they all probably always had the same crews, you know, the five crew, uh, the pilot, co-pilot, crew chief, radio operator, and navigator. But that's, uh, that was his job, was to make sure the planes were, were manned and ready to go. And like the one officer who was late and dropped an F-bomb on him, I assume, they told him that. And my dad told him to take the shuttle. <laughs> so, <laughs> that didn't exist anymore. So, other questions? Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, this, this was such a fun project for me. It's, it's, uh, I love doing this history kind of stuff. So, thank you. Oh, I forgot one other artifact. The bent, the bent crucifix, which I assume was in one of the hurricanes or typhoons. But, um, he, he saved it, so. Well, thanks, Kenneth. Uh, yeah. Great program. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Back anytime. Well, thanks. We have great programs like this on the first Wednesday of every month, except for January. We take January off each year. I'm not sure if that's to recover from New Year's or to plan for the rest of the year, but we take advantage of that. Uh, February 7th will be our next presentation, which Apparently a big secret since there was nothing listed on the website about what it's going to be. But newsflash, we've got the flyer. The February 7th program will feature the Boeing 747, history from first flight to last delivery. Speaker Tom Livesey, or Livesey gives an in-depth look at strategic transport aircraft Boeing 747. So he'll give a good, uh, good historical background on that, like it says, from first flight to the last delivery. Um, you can always go on to our website, again, like I said earlier, and check out any upcoming events. We have uh, boxes at the side of the, uh, this room and just outside the door for all the members who got in free, other than your membership. Um, if you can dig into your pocket and pull out a $5 bill and drop it in the box on the way out, it'll help us bring uh, more of these great programs every month. Becca, as always, great job. Thank you very much.
Thank you all for coming out tonight. Until next time, bye-bye and bye-bye. See you. Yeah.